Green bonds have been tipped to be the saviour of not only the planet, but the global economy as well. A tall order indeed. Just take a look at the EU's announcement that 30% of its recovery fund will focus on green bonds. However, is this really the case? Are green bonds the real green deal? To find this out, we're going to be discussing what green bonds are, why they have been growing, what's the strategy to implement them, what the key issues are, and what, if any, the solutions are to those key issues. But before that, if you're an economic enthusiast like we are, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and notification bell. We have a growing library of economic videos, producing a new one each week, but need your help, yes, you watching, to grow this channel. Now back to the video. So firstly, what are green bonds? In order to understand what a green bond is, we first need to understand what a bond is. At its simplest, a bond is a loan created by an issuer and bought by a lender, who becomes the bondholder, essentially an IOU. Typically a fixed income debt instrument, the debtor promises to pay a fixed amount repeatedly over the life of the bond. At the end of the bond's life, the debtor repays the principal amount plus any remaining interest. Simple enough. So armed with a first class understanding of bonds, green bonds are fixed income financial instruments where the proceeds are earmarked for financing green projects. These are created to fund projects that have positive environmental and or climate benefits. The majority of green bonds issued are green use of proceeds or asset linked bonds. Proceeds from these bonds are earmarked for green projects, but are backed by the issuer's entire balance sheet. The first green bonds can be dated back to 2007, when the European Investment Bank and the World Bank launched the AAA rated first green bond. Since then, green bonds have been on a pretty wild ride. According to the Financial Times, a total of $263 billion was sold globally in 2019, up from less than $1 billion a decade ago. Thinking for a second about how green bonds are utilised, their largest share goes to renewable energy, followed by clean transportation. As the market has exploded, a whole host of kaleidoscope coloured bonds have appeared. For example, in 2018, the Seychelles sold the world's first sovereign blue bond, a subtype of green bonds, which was debt issued to finance marine and ocean-based projects. Social impact bonds focus on positive social outcomes, while sustainability bonds focus on both being green and social. As you can see, green bonds can be considered to form one part of a much, much wider movement, the Environmental Social Governance Movement, or ESG to be precise, which has been making big waves amongst finances, corporates and governments alike, from the square mile to Wall Street. And this is crucial to the story of green bonds, as we're about to find out. So why has the green bond market been growing so rapidly? As has just been alluded to, investors and companies are paying increasing attention to their ESG. This is a huge undertaking, with the UN estimating that if the world is to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals, a staggering $90 trillion of climate investment will be required by 2020. Enter green bonds an investor, government and economy's way to achieve ESG objectives. You see, investors with a recorded $45 trillion of assets under management have made public commitments to climate and responsible government. With all this capital ready to roll, fixed income products like green bonds make the perfect green investment to achieve these goals. Financially speaking, they appear an attractive investment as well. According to Climate Bonds Initiative's latest report, green bonds are typically oversubscribed compared to vanilla bond equivalents. But, more importantly, the vast majority of green bonds were found to attract a premium, or so-called greenium. This is where a bond may be issued for a higher price, and therefore lower yield, compared to the company's outstanding debt. Delving into this greenium a little further, there is no reason why a bond being green should impact its price, since green bonds rank on an equal footing with bonds of the same rank and issuer. It is therefore assumed that cheaper debt raising is due to being green. Now, the demand for them is by no means limited to companies. Issuers from more than 50 countries have sold green bonds. Interestingly, they've even been used to finance China's Belt and Road Initiative, Poland opened the sovereign market in 2016, followed by the likes of France, Belgium and Ireland. This doesn't stop there though. 
with EU governments last year signing a pledge to become the world's first carbon neutral continent by 2050, a transition that will require trillions of euros in investment. From a more financial perspective, it's not an exaggeration to say that the EU is pinning a lot of its financial hopes of a recovery on green bonds. The EU recently agreed in principle a 750 billion euro recovery fund, of which EU leaders have promised to spend at least 30% 200 billion euros in the form of green bonds, a core driver of the market. So what's the strategy to implement them? Well, for the EU at least, this is where they enter uncharted territory. Whilst money will be lent out to all EU member states, the ultimate backstop will lie with those countries with the deepest pockets. EU sovereign debt aside, the recovery fund is an opportunity for the EU to become by far the largest green bonds issuer worldwide. In addition to their green nature, green bonds are anticipated to deliver a large multiplier effect through investment in job creating, economic stimulating fields like solar panels, clean technologies and energy infrastructure. Optimists say this represents an opportunity to future proof the economy, kickstart the economy of the future and achieve ambitious climate goals at the same time. But the real benefit is that the proceeds of green bonds are intended to be invested in further projects, creating a virtuous upward cycle of green prosperity. But, like all things which glitter with green, they are not without their challenges. So what are the key issues with using green bonds to stimulate the economy? Now let's be clear here, we're not advocating against the use of green bonds, but like any good economics channel, are highlighting the challenges to be overcome. Well, we can effectively split the key issues into two main camps. The economic and the environmental, and as an economics channel, we'll start with the economic. Perhaps the greatest issue is the extreme mismatch between demand and supply. As we've seen, demand for green bonds is high and is set to continue to grow. However, for a recovery fund to be truly effective, a ready-made stock of appropriate green projects is required. You can't just produce green assets because you're buying green bonds. There is also a risk that just like in the 2007 subprime crisis, excess demand for a financial instrument can have distortive effects with dire consequences. As the demand for ESG investments grows, this will inevitably attract more green funds, and with more funds comes the risk of declining manager quality, poorer management, and diminished returns as a result. Something to watch out for. A consequence of such a small market is liquidity risk. Now whilst demand is rising, the market is still small, so entry and exit, especially for larger volumes, may come at a cost. Another important reason for limited supply is cost. The cost to issue a green bond is not necessarily the issue, more the cost of continual monitoring, reporting and disclosing, which deters would-be issuers of green bonds. A key issue for governments is that linking green bonds to public expenditure can lead to more expensive or underfunding of areas of the budget not deemed as suitable. A pick-and-mix approach of earmarking the budget depending on proposed bond use runs the risk of favourably funding only areas deemed appropriate. Importantly, this could set quite a dangerous precedent. Will this mean financiers, as opposed to elected officials, have a significant say in how budget resources are used? Well, probably not whilst credit is cheap, but as deficits mount and austerity creeps in, Restrictions on how a budget can be used is definitely something to think about. Shifting away from the economics, green bonds have been criticised for greenwashing, which refers to the rather deceptive perception that an organisation is environmentally friendly when in reality it may not be. Any organisation or sovereign can in theory issue a green bond. This is because there is no internationally agreed standard definition of what qualifies as a green bond with standards like the green bonds principles being voluntary. And therein lies a key problem, a set of rules which are voluntary, creating a follow if you like approach. Linked to this voluntary nature is the way the green bond market has developed. Depending on the wording, if green promises are broken, this may not have any consequences on the borrower, save the reputational damage. Something which clearly undermines the whole point of a green bond in the first place. So, given these issues, are there any solutions? Well, there seem to be two main schools of thought. One is a purist approach, that green bonds must meet or exceed a certain threshold to qualify as being truly green. The other 
is that the fastest way for green bonds to grow is to focus on being less green. This compromising approach would focus on the transition to a green economy, rewarding changes in behavior which may not meet such a high threshold. For example, financing a more efficient coal power station. The main benefit of the second approach is that it enables scale to be achieved more quickly. This would help to address the supply-demand imbalance, as well as liquidity concerns. Realistically speaking, if the EU's recovery fund is to deploy such a quantum of funds into such a small market over a short time frame, a compromise on strict standards may be appropriate. Now, it may surprise you to learn that this second strategy is actually where we are already. The market isn't black and white, but shades of green. Three shades of green, according to Oslo-based green bond auditor Cicero. Dark green for things that will lower carbon emissions in the long run, like wind energy. Medium green for things that take a good step forward, such as plug-in hybrid buses. And light green for environmentally friendly steps that won't change long-term outlook on their own, such as more efficient fossil fuel infrastructure. Whilst a multi-shaded world isn't ideal, it acknowledges the reality which is that the economy is not yet ready for a pure green bond market, unfortunately. So overall, we've seen that the green bond market has dramatically risen over the last decade, albeit from zero. It still makes up a small proportion of the total bond market, but is being driven by rising ESG considerations. The largest experiment in the power of green bonds will likely be the EU's proposed recovery fund, yet they are not without their issues, like the extreme mismatch between supply and demand, the pricing risks this can lead to, how they could influence state budgets and austerity in years to come, alongside the potential for greenwashing. Solutions focus around two schools of thought, a purist approach of strict thresholds and a shaded approach, which incentivizes change and offers the largest route to scale. Ultimately, green bonds will be an increasingly used economic instrument to address global economic issues. Their win-win economic environmental style makes them too good an opportunity to miss. Yet when, if ever, they become market standard remains to be seen. As we come to the end of this video, we've hoped you've enjoyed it. Let us know what you think about green bonds in the comments below. Are they the macroeconomic savior or just another tool in the box? And as always, if you've enjoyed this video, please do hit the subscribe button and notification bell. See you in the next video.